tensions are high with the Taiwan-China situation, does the panel genuinely believe that China will escalate things? China may be forceful, but they don't do things rashly. So aren't they just flexing their muscles prior to their 20th party Congress that will occur later this year? I ask this as someone who has lived and worked in the region. Thanks, Julian. Pat Conroy. Oh, well, thanks, Stan, and, and thank you for the uh, excellent question. I can't engage in hypotheticals about what will happen in, in the future, but what I can say is it's in the interest of everyone in the region for de-escalation to occur now. We need restraint and we need to really focus on a peaceful and prosperous region where we respect and honour uh, the status quo that is there at the moment. The Australian Government's position is there should be no unilateral change to the status quo and there's a bipartisan commitment to the One China policy. Uh, Pat, just after the appearance of the Chinese ambassador at the National Press Club this week, where clearly there were red lines, mm. we will not compromise over Taiwan, he said, all necessary measures will be taken reiterating what we've heard from Xi Jinping about the potential use of force to, as the, public, uh, as the Communist Party sees it, reunify mm. Taiwan with the mainland. I'm wondering how that changes Australia's relationship with China, given that there were signs potentially of a thaw. Does that now put things on the back foot again? Well, I was concerned, like many people, by some of the language used by the ambassador yesterday. And we have been seeking to stabilise the relationship because that's in the interests of both China and Australia. Uh, but what is essential at the moment is that the escalation occur, the heat comes out of the tensions that are there. But let me repeat again that the Australian government's policy is to uh, that there can be no unilateral change to the status quo. Uh, that's essential. And as I said, the language there was a bit concerning. Uh, we just have to move past it. Australia will always stick up for its values and interests. Mm. But where we can cooperate with China, we, we will. Where we disagree, we will do that as well. James Patterson, Taiwan has always been uh, a flashpoint. 1996, things got very close to a conflict. Mm. But now it seems to be ramped up even further. Why are we seeing this change? Well, to come directly back to Sulin's question, uh, the late American poet uh, Maya Angelou had a wonderful phrase that when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And the Chinese Communist Party has not just shown us once who they are, they've shown us who they are in Tibet, they've shown us who they are in Xinjiang, they've shown us who they are in Hong Kong, they are showing us again who they are in Taiwan. And the ambassador at the press club yesterday showed us again who they are, and we should believe him. They are very serious when they say all options are on the table and that we should use our imagination to think about what they might do. Mm. And it doesn't require much imagination to think about what they might do. And we should believe them when they say that re-education of the 23 million free people of Taiwan is something that they have planned for after taking Taiwan. And we should treat that very seriously as Australia. I agree with everything that Pat said, and the opposition completely backs the government and the government's handling of this issue, and we completely back the 50-year bipartisan One China policy of Australia. But as a country, we need to be doing everything we can to contribute to our allies' collective efforts to discourage a unilateral and forceful change to the status quo. Sulin, can I come back to you? Is that how you see things? Do you believe that what we are seeing with the increased war games over Taiwan and the increased rhetoric, the real face of, of the Communist Party of China? I lived in Hong Kong, mm. so I was sort of... At the end of my time in Hong Kong, that was the rise of the umbrella, umbrella revolution, right? Mm. It happened on my doorstep. But, I don't know, it's, it's really hard cos I didn't think that was going to happen in Hong Kong, right? The, so the, I, the, the, the umbrella movement yeah, or, or what came after yeah, the crackdown? What, ca what has come. Right. But at the same time, you know, I, I'm of Chinese heritage, so we have this saying about saving face, right? And so I think what's happened in recent days, in a way, that is China, you know, it, it sort of responding to um, the US and Nancy Pelosi's visit, right? So I just don't think that they will be rash as to actually start war and an outright invasion of Taiwan. Mm. I just think that's going too far. And particularly with the current economic environment over there, right? It just mm. doesn't make sense. Jennifer, so, is that how you see it? So um, I'd like, to, I'd like us to um, 
think a little bit differently about the situation by placing Taiwan and its people, the Taiwanese, at the centre of the conversation. Because I think a lot of the media coverage that we've seen over the last two weeks have really centred on US-China. There's an island of 23 million people whose voice we haven't heard. What do they want? How do they see their futures? And I think um, in earlier this year, the Brookings Institution released survey findings to say 82% of Taiwanese want some form of status quo. That's a, that's a huge number. So, and a lot of Taiwanese commentators over the last two weeks have said, you know, people are getting by, getting on with their everyday lives in Taiwan. World War III is not imminent. The, the status quo does not mean Taiwanese independence, because that's always been the line, hasn't it? That, that the status quo holds, Taiwan does not seek independence, uh, the, the Communist Party, the, the PRC does not seek to change that balance. That, that's what you're saying, that the people would like to see remain. Yes, yeah, so I think Taiwanese, by and large, do not want to be in this um, military tension um, situation. They have a voice. They're a liberal democracy, it's vibrant, their civil society is active, and a lot of things have come to the fore because of that interaction between the democratic institutions mm. and the civil society of Taiwan, um, irrespective of what China is doing. So I think those are the things that we ought to be focusing on. It's interesting you mentioned status quo, though, and that that's something that came up, too, because in the conversations that I've had with military experts and officials in various countries, one of the things that needs to be recognized is that China has changed the status quo by its response to Nancy Pelosi's visit. There were missiles that dropped in Japanese waters in, that, in their exclusive economic zone. Some of the missiles flew over Taiwan. They were in an area that they haven't been before. And so I think one of the concerns that a lot of people have is even if this doesn't go all the way toward invasion, it's moving the line. It's changing the status quo and creating a dynamic where it can be more militarized more often. And so the standard of what's acceptable Chinese behavior mm. has now just moved. Does that then bring the clock forward as well? Because China is increasing its military capacity, Damien. Does that then raise questions about countries like the United States, Australia will be brought into that as well, to be able to resist that or support Taiwan in the event that, that there is hostility? Well, I think that's still the big unanswered question, right? Is, is this a part of the conversation has been about China versus the US? Because I don't think anyone anticipates that Taiwan on its own would be able to defend against China, mm. especially with its military and how much strength it's gained in the past few years. But in some ways, it goes beyond that, too. It's also about the allies in the region. And I think in some ways, this was a test case, not just for Taiwan, China, the United States, or even Australia. It's a test case for the entire Asia Pacific region. Where are people going to line up? Where are countries going to line up? Mm. And I think it's still really unsettled. And this happens a lot when there's great power competition if you look through history where these unsettled moments are often the most scary mm. moments. Sharon from where you sit in Europe what's the view from there of course there's a war underway in Ukraine but watching the events in Taiwan as well and, and if I can get you to factor this in as well when you talk about China you're also talking about an indispensable nation when it comes to the global economy the biggest engine of economic growth so there is so much hinging on this how do you see it? Well, you're right, Stan. You have more than 20 per cent of the world's population, about a third of the world's workforce, actually in China. And they are, for better or worse, part of the global economy. In a multipolar world where we're seeing fractures everywhere, there's a lot of posturing. But I want to return to, in fact, the point that if we don't put people, and I would add the uh, environment, people and planet, at the heart of our strategic thinking, and base that strategic thinking on a commitment to telling uh, the truth. I can't walk away from the fact that our unions uh, have been dissolved in Hong Kong, that our leaders are in jail. Am I worried about Taiwan? Yes, we have members there. But we also know that unless there's a sense of a common security and it's backed out by critical, honest dialogue to try and find common ground, then we're just escalating with, indeed, the kind of language we saw yesterday from the ambassador. Although I want to make a point about that. I listened to it very carefully. Mm. And under the bellicose language, there actually was a commitment to dialogue with Australia, to re-engage, but also to a broader global environment around trade and uh, settling trade disputes either through the WTO, that's a bit fractured right now as well, or bilaterally. So while we need to be very clear about our value set and about what human behaviour we can tolerate, 
And right now, I'd just say the Uyghur people forced labour, Hong Kong. At the same time, we would never argue that you don't engage with China because we have to find a common security for everybody. And it shouldn't be just about military security. That will not get us the distance we need to go.